Hey friends, my name is David Delagardel. I'm the owner and operator of Cedar Lore Forge, and I am the marketing strategist here at Coal Ironworks. Absolutely love working with my good friends here, and one of the blessings and benefits of working at Coal Ironworks is I have the opportunity to invite friends, colleagues, craftsmen who I have admired for years from around the world to come here and teach us their skills and knowledge, and of course not just teach us, but we want their knowledge to be shared with you guys. And we are calling that new endeavor the Coal Iron Collaborative. So this is the first of those many, Lord willing, videos that we're gonna be making. And the first of many guests that we're gonna have out here to the Forge is my good friend, Benton Frizzy from Evansville, Indiana of River City Forge and Tool. River City Forge and Tool, there we go. So I've admired Benton's work for years, have been super inspired by his abilities to forge absolutely beautiful, fully functional axes, just traditional tools that can be taken out in the field and used. He doesn't say he's an artist, but I disagree. I think he's an artist at what he does. And so I am super stoked and honored to have him here in the shop because I want to learn from him, of course, and I'm super stoked to share his knowledge with you guys. So today you will be forging what style of axe? So today we're going to be forging a two and three quarter pound uh, drifted eye axe. So this is typically more of an American pattern. These are a ton of fun to forge. And also with the punched eye, they're a super solid construction and they're a ton of fun to swing. So Benton at his own shop is a proud owner of a Coal Iron Works 25 ton press, correct? Right. Correct. So he's uh, used to our using our machines and we're stoked about that. So we've got a 25 ton out here. It's also got some special tooling attached to it. So we're really excited to share this new product with you guys today in the forging of his ax. So thank you guys for watching. Super stoked to learn from Benton and share his knowledge with all of you guys. We're going to fire up the forge and get to work. Let's do it. Thanks for watching. All right. So for this two and three quarter pound camp ax, what we're starting with, we're starting with a billet that is four inches long one inch wide and two inches tall. So I feel like this is a good size to get us to roughly a two and three quarter pound camp ax. So what we've got to do first is we've got to find center and we've also got to punch, uh, a center punch where we want to actually punch our eye on the press. Now, the most important thing I find with this size ax is I like a one inch pull. So I'm gonna punch, I'm gonna punch one inch in on center and then I'm gonna go up a half inch too, just so I can keep my punch straight and see and make sure that it's punching where I need it to go. So we're gonna go up roughly one inch and then half inch. And we're gonna find center, which will be here. So there's our first one. And we'll do our second one here. And just making sure I'm center. Cool. And then once we've got our marks, what I like to do is take a good old center punch. Make sure your punch is where you want it. One punch. Two punch. And then what I like to do is I just like to eyeball a middle punch. Mainly because I'm what I'm looking for here is visibility. So the goal is I want to be able to see these punches when this billet is orange or yellow hot and in the press and make sure I can get it pretty close to how I want it. So um, these will keep us straight and these will keep us on center. So for axe forging I like to use a couple different tools. Um, obviously we've got our billet. I've got an axe drift where if you look at the cross section it is shaped like an axe. This one's got a little bit of curvature to it. We've got, uh, I use a four pound rounding hammer to drive my drift. And then all of my hand forging and dressing, I like to use this three and a half pound cross bean. Um, I like this hammer because it's got a nice square face, which is nice for forging uh, axes. I've also got a set of what I call my Franken tongs. They're just a pair of mild steel tongs that I built that will hold this billet nicely. And the nice thing is once we get the eye punched and move forward, this will actually hold the ax nicely from the back side, from the pole side of the ax. And then once we move on to where we need to hold it from the other side, I've got a set of flat jaw tongs that I brought with me and that should do everything that we need. So forging axes can be a pretty hot process. So gloves are up to you guys. I like to wear a glove on my tong hand, especially if um, you're doing a lot of reaching in and out of the fire, depending on what type of forge you have. Now with a cold forge, you don't really have to worry about this. Um, it doesn't radiate nearly as much heat as the ports on a gas forge does. So for example, we're using a chili forge today. They're really nice. 
Um, they're really user friendly for getting in and out of the forge. Um, I've got a different style where you have to lift open a lid and it will take all the hair off your arm if you do that. So I usually keep a glove on. So today you'll see me, I'll be using the glove on and off my glove hand. It's personal preference and whatever you feel safe with. So we're getting ready to punch our ax billet for this, uh, for this build. So a couple of really important things about punching ax eyes, especially not, not just for a press, but also for a hand hammer and a hand punch. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get this billet and we're gonna take it over the press and we're gonna punch it three quarters of the way through the top and then we'll flip it and we're gonna punch it the last quarter of the way through the bottom. And what that should do, that should knock out a really pretty nice slug for us and then once we get it punched, then we're gonna drift it open by using a drift, uh, both the, the hand drift and a drift on the press. So this is one of the most important parts of ax forging because um, if you make some mistakes here, this is also your only chance to really correct them and to be able to move forward with the process. Because if you don't correct the mistakes that you make when you're punching, as you progress through the, the process, they only get uh, exaggerated tremendously. So. You can get in a lot of trouble, have a wonky shaped eye, an ax that hangs crooked, or even a, a crooked ax eye this way. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna hope for a uh, nice straight center punch. And if it doesn't, when we get our drift, we can overcorrect and shear some stuff off to try to fix that. So let's get this bad boy punched and see how it comes out. So this new punch lubricant, this is Delta Forge 31. Um, we started using this experimentally because Henkel sent us a bunch of it. And uh, it is a nano graphite in a water-based solution. And we spray this on our punches. The thing that I really like about it right from the start is that you can spray it on when your punch is still cold. So that first punch of the day still gets a really nice thick coating of graphite to lubricate it, even though it doesn't have the heat yet to burn off the carrier. Because we can spray it through a spray bottle, it's just a little more economical because you're not accidentally leaving your lid off and it all evaporating out. Um, it is very comparable function-wise to Fuchs, but it does give a little bit uh, less friction on the pull-out, the strip-out of your punch, and uh, I just love it. I think that it gives way better life to our punches. Um, when I'm using, like doing a production run of hammers, I'll do two punches and I'll just flip them back and forth so that one stays really nice and cool, and uh, I can get dozens and dozens and dozens of hammer eyes done with one punch set and just dressing at the end of that run. So again, we'll, we're gonna start selling this. You can still get Fuchs through us, but this is a great option if you're doing uh, some really complex dyes. You can spray it on your combo dyes and your work just guides right over the surface. It's just a really interesting kind of lubricant used in industry. They sent it to us. Um, we can get it by the truckload if we want it. So that's the new Delta Forge 31. Let's get it back. find the dark spot and we're going to punch the dark spot. Now we got it drifted. So what we have here, uh, the press I have at home is the old style coal ironworks is drift, so it's got a larger uh, top here. And what uh, we have here at the shop is a uh, bunch of rough forged uh, transitional ax eye drifts. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to grind this one to fit my drift and to fit the newer style uh, of the collets here on the, on the presses. So uh, I've got a 36 grit belt and we are going to hog this bad boy down to shape and get it ready so we can punch and get back to the X. All right, so the next step in this process is we are gonna drift our ax eye. Now, a couple of little tricks of the trade that I like to do 
If you notice in the billet, when I take the billet out, the billet will have a sway. And because the sway is where I punch first, and then I punch from the flat side. So what I'll do is I'll actually drift it in reverse order. And what this does is it helps square the billet back up and it helps reduce any kind of deformities or anything like that that we really don't want later in the process. So I'm gonna turn the press on. I've got it coated with some uh, lubricant and we're gonna drift this ax and see how the eye comes out. Once it's ready, then we can move on to the hand drift. So the next step in the process is we're going to put our hand drift in. So we'll actually drive our hand drift in uh, part of the way. So the goal is at this point, we're going to drift the eye to about 90% of the completed size. So we'll drive the drift in and then we're going to move over to the combo dies on the press and we're going to use the fuller part of the combo dies. We're going to start to spread the cheeks of the eye. So the idea is, is we'll get a nice even spread on one side and then uh, once we get that to where we want, it may take one or two heats, it just depends. Then we're gonna actually flip the ax over and we'll do the same thing. And whichever we decide to be the top or the bottom, while the ax is still hot, we will probably grind the top of the lanigans off on the grinder. So what we'll have is we'll have a nice flat top. And the reason, we, the reason that I like to do this is because it makes the forging process a lot easier. Whenever you flip the ax over on the press, and you want to set a fuller on the bottom, you've got a flat surface. It also keeps the ax from getting uh, oblong or any crooked shapes if you have a flat top to work the rest of the ax. So let's get this bad boy drifted and uh, we'll move on to the next step.
Ready? Yep. Voila. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so even so, now you can see it's starting, it's starting straight now. Sweet. Very cool. So now on this next heat, so this will probably be our top because this is the bottom that we punch. We usually get a better drawn out lane get, and it, it'll get the nice pointed lugs. So awesome. All right, so let's do the bottom next. Lovely. All right, so when we're fullering the eye of an axe, your general rule of thumb is you start in the middle of the billet and you work your way up the drift. So this axe on this billet, we will start squishing in the middle of the axe eye and fuller up. What this does is this gives you the best spread of your material. So then what happens is once we get this pretty well flat, as you can see, the top of this axe is pretty well flat. Obviously we're gonna do some grinding to clean it up, but once we have this top eye thickness where we want it, we'll go to the bottom and there's more material on the bottom because this is the bottom of the punch. This is where the, the slug came out. So there's more material and we will, we will drift it from the bottom next and we'll pull that material up. And because there's more material on the bottom, you'll get a nice lug or cheek or langet, whatever you want to call it on an ax. You'll get that nice shape to come up. And what that does is that gives you a better grip on the ax handle. It provides a better hang and better performance as well. So when we're talking about fullering the blade of an ax, there's three typical directions that you want to fuller to get your nice shape of an ax if you're going for a beard ax. So, the first direction you fuller is horizontal like this. And what that does is that gives you this spread. That spread and widens your blade. And then what I like to do is once I have this squish, it should look like if you take your fingers and pinch a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. The second direction is you forge and fuller diagonally. So once you have your beard of your ax drawn down by fullering at a diagonal angle, You'll notice that the toe of your axe is going to be much shorter. So then what you have to do is fuller directly across the top to bring the toe of your axe out. So in conclusion, to fuller a typical axe blade, you're doing three directions. You're doing the middle to get your spread and get it this way. Then you do diagonal to bring your heel or your beard down. And then to finish it off, you'll fuller directly across the top to pull your ax blade this way. And what that'll do is that'll give you a nice shape in terms of aesthetically, and it'll also give you a nice shape performance where you can get your hand under the blade and choke up if you need to. So this is the, this is the pattern we're gonna follow when we start forging and fullering our ax blade. So you'll see some distortion here, but that's not the axe eye. That's just because we squished it this way to get the drift out. Yep. What we're gonna do now is I'll put the drift in and I'm actually gonna set a very slight fuller on the pole of the axe. What that does is it, it makes it a little bit more aerodynamic, so to speak, a better usage, but also it's gonna separate some more material and we can bring the lugs of the axe down and get a better, uh, a better look on these. So that's our next step. We're gonna do it all from the bottom of the axe. So let's heat it back up.
what you see is we have this fuller here and that is separate some more material for us to draw down. And also in terms of from this angle here, it makes the pole a little bit narrower and it just looks nicer and it feels better in use. All right, so we have our, our billet rough forged. We've got our eye, we've got our, our cheeks drawn down, but we gotta do some cleanup on it. And this is just my personal preference of, of doing some cleanup on this billet for the, the future processes. So what we have is we have a very square billet and we've got some, some variation in the surface up here. So what I like to do is I like to grind this as clean as I can to get a flat surface. And then what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna set a fuller right here. So we'll set about a, probably a, a one inch or a three quarter inch fuller. And so what that'll do is that'll help draw this blade out. And it creates a nice separation between, uh, between the eye and the blade. So we're gonna, set a, we're gonna set a one inch fuller this way. And then we're also gonna set a one inch fuller that way. And it's just like the design of a sports car. The idea is we want a nice transition here from blade or from blade to eye. And we will have a nice thin blade that will bite deep into wood. And the nice thing is with this size ax, because of the weight that we'll be swinging, it'll still split firewood kindling. Won't split big rounds, but it'll split some nice firewood. So that's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna, we're gonna grind this top clean to get a flat surface. That way we don't distort it when we set our fullers and then we will set a fuller in front of the eye to separate the blade and the eye and then we'll set a small fuller on the bottom. Alright, we're going to grind this flat. Doesn't have to be perfect, we just want it pretty well flat and not angled. That'll work. Now what we'll do is we'll take another heat and we'll do our three three step fullering process. So you'll see when we set this fuller, it has gotten a little off. So what we will do is on our next heat to correct this, we'll actually, before we, before we do this part, we'll put the drift back in and we'll straighten it. Actually, I might be able to do it right now. This is where the, the breadth of the 20 die really comes in handy. So the nice thing about every time we turn the, the ax up and give it a slight squeeze this way is it also keeps your pole, the back of the ax, nice and straight, okay. which in the end process it's going to look really nice and it act, it'll actually minimize the amount of grinding we have to do. Okay. So, uh, And that's the goal for this. The goal is to do the least amount of grinding possible. So. Absolutely. Alright, so let's move on to our fullering process.
now that we've got those three fullers set, what we'll do is on our next heat, we'll come out and we're actually going to, we will actually set the ax on the dies like this and we will set our fuller down here. And what that'll do is that'll correct the bit of the fan out on the top that we've gotten and it'll keep our, our, our flat, so. Beautiful. And then we'll, we'll keep drawing it out. spreading the axe blade and drawing it out. It just cleans that up a lot. Awesome. Very cool. And I think we have enough heat now. Yeah, we have enough heat now We've got a pretty hard transition from the eye to the blade. And once we get this blade drawn out roughly how we want it, we'll put the drift back in and with a hand hammer, we're gonna dress all and plainish all of this and clean up our transitions. And we'll also do a final eye size and drift, the very last heat that we do. So we'll do, um, we're gonna do one more heat, drawing it some more, and then we'll move on to the hand hammer. We'll address our, our, uh, our beard, my favorite part of the axe process is moving on to the hand hammer because no matter what, how much I love using power tools and things like that, I'm still a blacksmith. I love swinging a hand hammer. And in my opinion, once you start to forge this blade and then you move on to your hand tools, that's where the axe really comes alive. That's where the axe develops its personality. That's where its, it's intended use really comes out and uh, it just really takes shape and it's awesome. Cool. Love it. So what we've done is we've rough forged our taper. You notice the end's kind of messy, but that's fine. We're gonna grind all that off and really refine our shape. So what we've got now is we've got our distal taper, so to speak, of our ax blade. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave the press alone for a while, and we're gonna go back to the anvil and do all of our, um, our hand forging, our hand dressing. So what we'll do is we're gonna clean up the bottom of the, the ax blade, and we're actually gonna work on uh, planishing a lot of these blows, and, and forging our final little bevel in. So we're gonna really tweak and refine this now. So this is the, this is the fun part, I think.
Next heat, we're gonna focus finally on the beard. We'll use a lighter, smaller two pound round, uh, rounding hammer to really get in there and clean that up. So then our last heat, what we're gonna do is we're gonna fix the eye and then we'll actually go over to the, hopefully, the, the press and press our maker's mark in. So when we do the eye, we're gonna dress the eye and we're also gonna take the hammer and knock down some of these ridges. So we'll go in from the bottom first and then the top. Our, my maker's mark in this and when we when we stamp this style of an axe you want to stamp it on this side so when you hold the axe with the blade facing away from you you're looking at the maker's mark now when you're stamping an axe there's about three different locations that you can stamp an axe you can stamp it on the blade anywhere here on the blade I personally don't like to do that because typically when I when I stamp on the blade I got to straighten the blade back out you can stamp on the cheek of the eye, which is nice because you can drive the mandrel through or your drift and you don't have to worry about deforming your eye because there is something through it. Now, you can also stamp on the pole of the axe. 
here. And there are many axe makers that do this. There are many professional axe makers that do that. It's all personal preference. So today we are probably going to punch it with the maker's mark on the cheek of the eye. But also I am here at Call Ironworks and I have a lot more tools at my disposal than I do at my house. So we might stamp it on the pole. So we'll see, let's heat it up and find out. Ready to grind this, clean up our profile, and we'll move on to heat treat. So now that we've got our axe forged, we're going to move on to grinding the axe. So there's a couple of different rules of thumb that I like to follow when we are grinding an axe. So traditionally, what I will do is I will grind my outside profile first. And there's a couple of things to take into effect. Now, certain patterns of axes are benefiting from a swooped up toe, but for myself, for a standard working camp axe or anything like that, I like to have a flat top. So what I'll do is I will take and I will actually run with a Sharpie a line across to follow. Now, I may not necessarily grind down to this line, but that gives me a rule of thumb. And then I will focus on the beard of the ax. So depending on what kind of contact wheel and how clean you forge, you can refine your shape and get a nice cleaner look. Now, I like to have a little bit more of a swooped beard because when this is on a handle, you can get your hand choked up and get it under the blade for close intimate work. And then once I get these two, then I'll move on to the edge. Now what I'll do is sometimes I'll grind it straight to get rid of all this flange and all this stuff, or sometimes I'll go ahead and I'll grind it straight onto a curve. It just depends on how the ax feels as I'm grinding it. Once we have these three steps done, we'll move on to our pole. So what I like to do is, you'll notice where I squished it, we have a ridge on the ax. I'll actually grind that flat, I'll grind this to have a, a shallow curve, and then I'll chamfer for the whole thing. And there's a couple different things you can do. You can polish this and not have a nice clean polished look on it, or you can grind it to a 120, 220 grit, and then you can blacken it when you heat treat. And then if you need to, you can kind of clean up your langets and your lugs a little bit. I'll do a little bit of dressing on some of these where they got a little um, mushroomed in the drifting process. And then once we have this, profile done, then we'll move on to the edge. And what I like to do is I like to do a high grind. So we'll do a high grind and it'll be a convex. So the difference in your convex, so instead of having a V grind, which is excellent for, for woodworking and tools, I will do a convex grind, which is rounded and it's tougher and it still gets really, really hair popping, shaving sharp. So this style gets really sharp too, but it's just not as tough. And this is the all around good working edge that I like to use. So let's get to grinding our ax. So what we're gonna do now, we have our profile ground 
I've chamfered my edges here. So what I'll do is I'm gonna grind, I know I put a straight line, but I'm actually gonna grind a curved edge and then I'll chamfer my top and then I'm, we're gonna clean up our pole and we're gonna do it all on uh, this contact wheel because I just find that's what's easiest. Uh, it hogs away material a lot uh, quicker than a flat or anything like that. So, and it's what I have and I use it home so it's what I'm used to. So let's get this bad boy ground and then we'll get it uh, heat treated and we'll put it on a stick. So just to talk about your edge, right? So we've got we've got a slight curve on this axe. So I like a slight curve on an axe bit because uh, it works better for biting deep into wood, especially if you're gonna be doing any kind of felling, bucking, and I like it for splitting as well. Now, if we were doing a woodworking axe, like a carpentry axe or a carving, or a carving axe would have a, a curved bit as well. But if you were doing, uh, especially a, a carpenter's axe or anything like that, you would want a flat, uh, a flat bit on this. So what we'll do is now we're gonna move back to our pole again, clean up our pole, and then just wanna talk about how to grind this bevel. So coming over to the grinder, how I like to set in my, my bevels are, um, I will start my grind this way and this way. And what I'll do is I'll grind it down almost sharp. Not sharp, but almost sharp. And once I get that bevel set how I really want it, then I'll move and I have this line and I will work the ax this way to give, give the ax that convex edge. And I would just move it up and down. And what that'll do is, is that'll give me a real nice taper. And since I have it already almost sharp, I will stop at that point and then I will hop from the 36 up to a 60 grit and then I will likely hop up to a uh, 120 grit before heat treat. Now, uh, you'll notice that the bottom of the ax and the top of the ax, I, I won't touch that any more than 36 grit because this is gonna get black anyway. It's gonna be blackened after heat treat. But what I will do is the, the bit and the pole, I will grind to a higher grit. It just provides a nicer looking product and a nicer looking finish. So let's get our pole cleaned up, get it nice and ground, squared, chamfered, and then grind our bit, and then we'll be ready for heat treat. So now we've got our bevel ground on this ax. And like I said, I like a high grind. I like to leave a little bit of this texture transition here. Uh, it's just a look that I really like on my axis. So um, I've got it on both sides and it is almost sharp. You can see the discoloration along the edge. It's nice and thin. This ax is ready for, for stepping up. I'll probably jump from the 36 straight to maybe a 120 just to uh, get it cleaned up a little bit and then we can get it hardened. We've got our kiln heated up and ready for us. So I've never used a Scotch-Brite belt before and Dave has been harassing me about using <laughs> this belt. So I'm gonna give this a try and what I'm gonna do 
is this is the more aggress aggressive of the scotch Bright belts. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over the parts of this ax that I'm not going to grind anymore. So we'll go over all the bottom, all the chamfers, everything, the pole and, uh, and the top and see what kind of finish and what it looks like when we get done with it. Hopefully it'll have a cool texture and then when we heat treat it, it'll develop a really cool texture, so. Yep. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> All right, so we've got our axe completely ground, uh, finished with the scotch Bright belts that Dave recommended, which is an <laughs> excellent, excellent recommendation. So what we're gonna do now, we're at the kiln that Coal Iron uses to heat treat uh, all of their dyes and everything. We're gonna give this a good soak uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, let it come up to temperature, and then we're gonna quench it. This is 4140. This is the steel that I personally like to use to forge my axes. So we're gonna actually uh, soak it at 1500 and then I have a high-speed quench and we're gonna quench in this high-speed quench to get the best hardening results that we can uh, Once we do that, we'll temper this the old-fashioned way in the forge uh, And then we'll get it put on a handle and you guys will get to see the finished product. So we're almost at the finish line I feel like this is a big MF for here. Yeah, it's it'll be pretty hot when it opens up. So how's it open? Side? Yeah, just like that Sweet. Sweet. So now we're ready for the quench. So we're gonna take this ax head out and we're gonna quench it. This is some high speed quench oil. This is a uh, Black Bear number 100 quench. It's a little bit slower than Parks 50. Uh, it was just something that I was able to find at the time. So we're gonna do a full quench. This will harden uh, the entire ax head, including the pole. And then when we temper it, we will actually soften the pole as well. It'll be a little bit softer than the, than the ax blade itself. So let's get this bad boy quenched and hardened. So with 4140, it has to have a pretty quick quench. So I like to do an agitated quench like this uh, just to make sure I get all the vapor, uh, vapor bubbles around the head. Um, I get rid of those because that, that will slow your quench. So um, the nice thing about these high-speed quench oils, this Parks 50, the, the cooling curve on these Basically what it does is it, it cools super fast until 900 degrees. And then at 900 degrees, it tapers off. So the nice thing is if you're doing blades or anything like that in these quenches, you can, um, you can straighten warps or anything like that. So, and then you'll get full Martensitic conversion around 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Hmm. Very cool. So I don't know if you can hear it, but it's very glassy sounding and the file is definitely, definitely skating. So this is still about 800 degrees. So we're gonna put her back in there and let her cool off. And once it gets where it's just about stopped smoking, it should uh, be hard as woodpecker lips. <laughs> All right, folks. Now what we're gonna do that we've got this hardened, I like to wire wheel it. What it does is it gives it a nice clean finish. It gets off the scale that would have built up in the heat treat. Um, and also since we hit it with this really nice Scotch-Brite, uh, this will clean up to a real nice oily gunmetal finish, which is I think something that will look 
really nice. So we're gonna hit it on a wire wheel and get it cleaned up and then we're gonna finish grind it probably to you know uh, maybe a 220 grit. We'll temper it and then we'll scotch brite it again and it'll be sharp and ready to hang and ready to swing. Okay, so this is what the head looks like pre-wire wheel after heat treat. You can see there's a lot of crazy off colors, a lot of weird textures. And what we've done is we have hit it with the wire wheel and what it gives it just such a nice shiny gunmetal finish here on the forged scale surface. So keep in mind, this will be ground clean again up here towards the tip. But I mean, even looking at the, the finish on the top, with the, where we did hit it with the, the fine scotch bright, It just really makes a difference. I like to wire wheel most of my stuff that I leave for scale. Some people will take them and soak them in uh, ferric chloride or even uh, muriatic acid to eat the scale off. But I like this look quite a bit. This is a much cheaper and a much uh, less toxic way to get it. Yeah, I agree, love it. Now, it's time to polish. All right, the last thing that we need to do to this head before we sharpen and hang it is we need to temper it. So what we're gonna do, there's multiple different ways that you can temper an ax head or a knife or anything like that. Uh, sometimes we will do things the old fashioned way. And so today we're gonna temper the old fashioned way in the forge. Um, ideally, you probably wanna give uh, a couple two hours temper cycles at whatever your steel is. Uh, you can follow your, your heat treat guide from your steel supplier. So what we're gonna do with this, uh, which it turned out really nice uh, with the, the contrasting colors on the head and the textures, thanks to Dave's recommendation with the scotch Brite belt. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fire up the forge. And what I, what I really wanna focus on is this pole is hardened. The whole head is hardened. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna heat the back and I'm gonna watch for the temper colors to draw into a straw color up here uh, at the bit. Now the reason I'm doing that is because I do want the pole a little bit softer than the blade. Uh, ideally I'm going for somewhere in the 56 to 57 Rockwell, um, but if I start my heat back here and dance the blade in, or the, the whole ax blade in and out of the fire, I should be able to get a softer temper back here than I do up here. Now you can also, if you had a, a drift shaped object, you could heat it up to cherry red orange and sit it in the ax and let the temper run out this way, but we don't have that. We have things that are ax eye shaped, but we don't want to ruin them. So we are going to do it the old school way. So what I'm really going to be focusing on is watching this straw color run throughout here. Now you'll notice that once I get it to the temper I want, I'm going to dunk it in a bucket of water. Now since I'm not heating this up to cherry red or anything like that, you can use water to stop a temper. So the idea is when we get this to the temper that we want, we will put it in the water to stop it. Now you don't want to do that if the steel is obviously red hot. Uh, or anything like that because that's no bueno. But that is how we're gonna control our temper on this ax. So, and I'm also gonna go ahead and go into the forge before it really heats up because we don't wanna heat this up, we just want to temper it. So you'll notice we're getting a smoke off of this already. Um, one of the reasons that we grind this clean, and you can see the langets are already starting to turn some colors, and it's starting to run down this way. One of the reasons that we grind the oil off of the bit, because if you, if you don't have a heat treat oven and you're going by color, 
oil still on your axe head can, or on your knife or anything can give you a false read. So it can actually heat up and change colors really quick and you think it's tempered, but it's actually not. So that's why we clean the, that's why we clean the oil off of the business end. Okay, so what we've done is we have gotten this tempered about to how we want it. So what we have is we have this nice straw color. We do have some purple coming in on the bit here, um, but if you look, you can see this is a, a fingerprint here from where I had handled it, it fits perfect. So this is a really deep straw, the bit's nice. The pole I drew to a soft blue, so it's still hardened, but it's gonna be like low 50s. Uh, which is nice for a, um, and you can really see the color transitions mm -hmm. here. So that'll be nice for a hammer pole. It won't chip. It, it's so much less likely to chip. So it's always nice to look at the axe when it has the pretty rainbow colors because it's the only time it's going to have it. Mm -hmm. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a finish cleanup on it and then we're going to hang it on a handle. So we're ready to get this on a handle now. This is not a handle I carve. This is one that I purchased. There's a lot of really great ax handle suppliers in the United States. Uh, this is American Hickory. It's got some pretty heartwood versus sapwood in it. Um, what we're gonna do is we are gonna thin this down and um, sand it and then we will actually burn it. So I'm gonna modify this a little bit. This one came from Beaver Tooth Handles. They make really great handles. Uh, my personal favorite is Whiskey River Trading. They uh, carry premium select handles, top notch uh, grain and uh, just quality handles. You can also go to places like House Handle in Missouri that, that carry great handles um, at a great price point and availability. So you can also pick up the ones from your hardware store. I mean, they're great. You just wanna strip off the, 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 uh, the shellac and the vinyl finish because it will give you blisters and you do want blisters. So we're gonna sand this baby down, get it nice and cleaned up because it's dirty. And then we're gonna hang it, uh, we're gonna burn it and hang it on the, on the ax head. Before we hang this head on this handle, we are actually gonna burn the handle to give it a nice pretty color and a cool effect. So this handle is one of the, it's actually the same handle from the same supplier and I've burnt the uh, fawn's foot or palm swell down here and faded up and it's been oiled and used in, in my truck and on my four wheeler and everything. So what we're gonna do is I've got this handle cleaned up to the 220 grit and we are gonna burn the palm of this handle and then we are gonna oil it and we are gonna hang this ax and it's ready to roll. So. So you'll notice I, when burning a handle, uh, I don't stay in one spot long. I don't want to burn it so much that it actually checks and splits on us. So uh, I got to take my time, be, di be gentle with it, and hopefully all comes out well. After burning this handle, what, I, what I've done is I've taken my time up through here and I just don't want to burn it too much and take any chances on there being moisture in the wood and it cracking. The nice thing is I've gotten roughly the same finish that I'm going for. So now what we're going to do, we will actually hang this axe head, the one we made today, on this handle and then before we're done, we'll wipe everything down with a uh, linseed oil beeswax mixture finish, including the head and uh, when we wedge it. So let's get this thing wedged on here and it's done. Okay, so we are ready for the assembly of this ax. So we've got some components here I wanna talk about when it comes to hanging an ax. That's the term in the industry when you put an ax head on an ax handle. The term is hanging an ax. So we've got our handle. What we have is the handle, the head. We have a poplar wedge. I like using a softwood wedge because it compresses really nice. And we've got wood glue. So you can use tight bond, you can use Elmer's, you can use whatever tickles your fancy in terms of wood glue. So what we're gonna do is we are going to put the head on the handle and we'll seat it. And I'll show you how to properly seat it. And then we will put a little bit of glue on here and drive the wedge in. 
and then we will just trim the overhang a little bit. So first off, we're gonna put the head on the handle. So this is a pretty good fit, but what you wanna do to really lock an ax head on is you turn it upside down and you give it some, some upside down bangs and what that does is that, that seats it onto the, onto the head. So this, this head is, or this handle, it's, it's tight now. And so now what we'll do is we'll put a little dabble of glue here. And it doesn't take much glue for an ax, uh, for an ax wedge. Um, you just do just a little, just a little bit because it's going to ooze out everywhere when you're done. So then what we do is we line our wedge up how we'd like it. So this wedge is a little long, so it's going to get trimmed off a little bit as we drive the wedge. So you can hear it gets tighter. And as we get roughly to where we want it to be, we are gonna turn it upside down, gently drive it one way, and then you spin it around. Then you're gonna spin it around. And we check our fit to see if this is swelled nicely. And it looks like it's starting to. So I'm gonna drive it just a little bit more to make sure we got this nice and locked on here. And ideally this would be done with a dead blow hammer or a wooden mallet, but I've just got my old uh, trusty rounding hammer. So you can see the profile, how we have a swelled out wedged head. Now what we'll do is we'll actually trim this off and just clean it up a little bit on the uh, two by 72 and then oil it down and this bad boy is done. and clean it up on the 2x72. Okay. So we're ready to put the final finish coat of oil on this axe handle. I like to use oils that really wake up the wood, make the wood come to life. There's all kinds of really great things. You can use Danish oil, you can use boiled linseed oil, you can use mineral oil, whatever you prefer. I like to use a concoction that I make that I sell on my website called uh, Tool Conditioner, and it's available at rivercityforge.com. It's a nice mixture of boiled linseed oil and some wax and some other chemicals as well. And what it does is it helps protect, seal, and moisturize the wood. So I've already got some on a napkin here, and what we're gonna do is we are going to apply it at the palm swell first. And a little bit goes a long way. And you can apply it with a paper towel or anything like that. So what I do is I'll do the palm swell first Really good, a nice, good coat. You can also do it while it's still hot after you've burned it, and it really helps with penetration. And then what I'll do is I'll use a different part, a cleaner part of the napkin, not to spread up the darkness of the, the burnt wood. And I'll get a little bit more, put it on here, and start rubbing it in. Now the nice thing about this stuff that I use, that I made, um, you can also use it on steel to protect steel from rust. And 
And this, this handle has a lot of really nice transition between the different types of wood in the tree. We'll get just a little bit more. You can also apply it with your hands, but I recommend washing your hands afterwards. This is always cool because you can get the real greenness of the poplar to come out with the mixture. All right, and now we'll wipe the head down with it. I don't usually get it up on the bevel at first because it can make the bevel look like it's not polished because this is a wax. But I always do the head last because there's a lot of residual oil on the head from heat treat. So you're obviously gonna get some handle prints on it, but it is an ax after all. And then what I do is I take it and I flip the paper towel to the clean side and I wipe off the excess. And this can, your oils, whether it be this mixture or boiled linseed oil, if it's a new ax, you can go through and reapply it every couple of months or once a week or the important thing is just to make sure it's protected. Now we've got a finished, ready to swing, ready to work hard ax. I hope you guys have really enjoyed this process. This process is really near and dear to my heart. I love forging axes and I love sharing the process of forging axes. So I hope this process and this video helps everyone that wants to learn how to forge an ax, whether you've got a press or a power hammer or doing it all by hand. I hope it helps you become as obsessed with ax forging as I am. So thank you guys so much for watching and thank you to Cole Ironworks for having me out to do this awesome and fun video for you guys. So that was an amazing process to witness, of course, in person. I hope you guys enjoyed witnessing that as well and uh, gained as much from it as I did. Benton, brother, thank you for coming out and uh, sharing what you know with myself and everybody watching. So if you guys enjoyed this, whether or not you are a member of the Coal Iron Works press owning family or not, if you like this and want to try forging your own ax with whatever tools you have, be sure and check the list of products in the links below in this video here on YouTube because you'll find, of course, links to the different products featured that we offer at Coal Iron Works. But of course, I want you guys to check out Benton's website, River City Forge. Dot com. Okay, there we go. And uh, you can check out his ax handle conditioning, uh, wax that he makes and offers, and of course his handcrafted axes and blades that he has for sale on there as well. And of course, be sure to subscribe because this is just the beginning of the Coal Iron Collaborative. We really want to create more educational content with amazing colleagues and friends like Benton and others who are going to be coming out in the near future and sharing more knowledge with you guys. Uh, people can find you on what other social media platforms? So you can find me on Instagram at, um, at Frizzy Forges with Fire. And I'm on Facebook as well. Anybody's welcome to add me if they like. My business page on Facebook is also River City Forge and Tool. And yeah, my website's rivercityforgeandtool.com. Awesome. Of course, you guys know coaliron.com. You can find my work at cedarloreforge.com. And you can find me on Instagram at cedarlore. But again, thank you guys for watching. God bless and happy axe forging your endeavors on the road ahead. Peace.